بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلوات وأتم التسليم على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear brothers and sisters and welcome again to another program here on Hadi TV it's going to be our second session on this topic called Beyond Belief. And we will be tackling the ideological challenges that we have in today's society. And the main foundation of what it is that I will be dealing with is how we are able to look at the very core beliefs of human beings, irrespective of which kind of religion they are affiliated to or what sect they follow or anything else. As human beings, as mankind, we have so many commonalities, so much that we share with one another. But before I start with uh, today's session, I would just like to express my condolences to all the followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhum as -salam, on what we are going to be commem commemorating in these couple of days, and that is the martyrdom anniversary of As Siddiqatul Kubra, Bidatul Rasul, Sayyida Fatima Tul Zahra, peace be upon her, the beloved daughter of the Holy Prophet. Of course, there is absolutely no need for us to introduce the uh, daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, she who he, the Prophet, had said in, re, in, in her regard, in her favor, in merit of her, Fatima bid'atun minni. Fatima is a part of me. Whenever the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi yearned the scent of heaven, he would go towards her and he would sit with her. He would place her in his seat whenever she entered into any kind of gathering. And this is to show publicly the level of respect and honor that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi had for his daughter Fatima to Zahra, peace be upon her. And so it does uh, bring about a lot of uh, memories for those who are uh, devoted to Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam in knowing that she was oppressed and she was wronged uh, once the Holy Prophet, praise and peace be upon him, passed from this world. And hopefully we will be able to enlighten ourselves through the remembering of Fatima to Zahra, peace be upon her. We need to use her as an example for ourselves and for women of society. And she is a role model for women. She is also a role model for men as well, where we can learn, men and women can learn from her so many different valuable lessons. Carrying on with what we were speaking about from our last session, where we entered into the topic of what we call Jabr. And I did explain the reason why we're speaking about Jabr, even though, or determinism, or predestination, or any of the other English equivalents we used for this word, where someone is coerced um, or forced into accepting what their fate and destiny is and they have no choice or no say in where it is that they are or what it is that they do or in particular the point that I'm trying to emphasize on what is it that they think and the reason why we're commencing we're starting off with this particular 
area, even though it's a deep theological, philosophical uh, discussion, is because when we look at those around us, we know for a fact that not everyone shares our same belief system. Someone might be even of the same sect, of your same sect, but still have a different outlook on certain details of a particular issue, whether it be ideological, whether it be theological, whether it be to do with the moral decisions that um, people might make. So where do these differences uh, come from? What is the origin of these differences? One way of looking at it is by us starting off by saying that, well, a person, because of their environment, because of their nurturing, because of their upbringing, because of the social factors around them, they chose to be who they are and what they are. And therefore, you know, uh, God, for example, cannot uh, judge them or condemn them. And, you know, there's no merit or favor in you being who you are because if you were born into a Shi'i family, then uh, that's only uh, because of that that you are now a follower of the Shi'a path. Or else if you were born in a Sunni family or an atheist family or a Christian family, that's how you would grow up and that's what you would think that um, truth is or that's what you would think that um, the ideology is valid and uh, everything else that comes along with it. But if we were to uh, look at it from this particular angle in the sense that are we even able to say that there is some kind of uh, social determinism that exists among us and therefore we cannot be held accountable or responsible for what we believe on an ideological level and whether there's going, there are going to be problems that stem from this. Now, looking at it in this particular way, I did mention towards the end of the previous program that Almighty God in the Holy Quran uh, says very clearly that you need to be wary of yourself. You need to pay attention to yourself. You need to be concerned of yourself. Alaykum and fusakum. It clearly means make sure that you are focused on what you are thinking of, what you believe, what you are doing. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu alaykum anfusakum. O you who believe, be concerned about yourself. Why? Because there might be others who do go astray. There might be others who don't think in line with your kind of thought. That shouldn't harm you, that shouldn't affect you, that shouldn't kind of uh, uh, ruin any kind of self-motivation that you have. Why? Because if you are on the path, if you have been guided, then that's the way that you need to stay. Now, there is another verse in the Holy Qur'an that I would like uh, to also uh, share with you, and that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, speaks about uh, the human nature where we have a primordial nature an instinct that was has been embedded within us as human beings and this is uh, in reference to that covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that pact that that ahd that God made with us that we made with God's uh, with God and that we um, pledged to the Almighty in a previous entity, in a previous existence. That itself is a, a topic on its own. But, you know, talking from uh, a Quranic perspective, this is um, how it is. Where, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after speaking about this nature, this fitra of a human being, He says, أَوْ تَقُولُوا إِنَّمَا أَشْرَكَ آبَاؤُنَا مِنْ قَبْلُ Or you are going to say that our forefathers were polytheists and we were we are just the offspring of uh, our polytheist forefathers you know so we're saying they're indirectly saying or directly saying that you know we have no choice in what it is that um, 
uh, we are and where it is that we have got to because of our polytheist forefathers and of us being their progeny and their offspring. And this verse is in Surah Al-A'raf, verse number 173. So here in the uh, con continuation of this ayah, the Almighty is speaking about this particular primordial nature where it's not going to allow someone to uh, cling onto this kind of justification that because your forefathers were in this particular uh, situation or they uh, were of this level of affluence or they had this kind of ideology and therefore uh, it's going to carry on generation after generation. That's certainly not the case, especially when we see that Islam itself was a perfect example. Christianity itself itself was is is and also a wonderful example. You know where someone was brought up in this kind of pagan way or was in this very very remote um, tribe or village, and then all of a sudden they adopted this particular religion or they changed their ways uh, in this particular uh, scenario. So seeing that we don't believe in any kind of um, social coercion that a person is compulsed to uh, be in or, or is forced to be in and there are uh, external factors that could play a role in a person's situation being as they are but we as human beings still have that choice and that ability to see things around us in a different way and and the holy quran from a muslim perspective the holy quran in many different verses speaks to us about responsibility we said that you know if you are not going to be accountable and responsible for what it is that you are doing and what you're saying and what you're thinking and what you're believing then um what way are we going to be able to distinguish between right and wrong and good and bad let's give an example for this you know are you responsible for what you say verbally look at the traditions that we have in our islamic heritage from ahlul bayt alayhim salam that uh, speak about how we need to be extra extra cautious about what it is that we say we're so much so that in some uh, examples that have been given our neck should be as long as that of a camel where the thought process of what we think about before we say it goes through so many different if we could say censoring until we say it and that because whatever is said cannot be returned cannot be brought back we can't rewind something that has already come out verbally it's out there and you know if only people were indeed more cautious about what it is that they did say because uh, I'm very sure all of us have experienced this one way or another words do hurt you know and if you're not cautious if you're not responsible for what you uh, say then these hurtful wor words might a traumatize someone might uh, hurt them so much that the damage is irreversible and that's of course very very sad if someone is not careful about what it is that they say now if we were to say well it wasn't me and um, I don't have control over my tongue and I can't um, uh, be careful about what it is that they say no one would accept this kind of excuse you know probably once you know your l tongue might slip or you might you know at the spur of a moment be get get so angry and uh, lose your temper maybe once maybe twice but for um, someone to be habituated about uh, doing this about using obscenity about you know hurting other people's feelings and then them 
not and then them not being responsible or accountable for what it is that they say no one in any society would accept that and that's why whatever the components be whatever the elements might be the factors uh, external or uh, internal we still need to make sure that we understand that we are able to think we're able to go through all of these things and know them in such a way where we will be responsible and accountable. And that's what leads us to looking deeper into this topic of theological jabr or theological predestination or determinism. Where are we able to say uh, that on a level of existence we uh, have the choice of creating or not creating of reproduction and bringing someone into life but then when uh, someone does come into existence then that choice is no longer theirs anymore they lose that ikhtiyar you know there are certain words that we probably going to be repeating uh, jabr which we've already explained ikhtiyar which we've used a few times and that means choice and irada which means will now me as a human being i go through so many different stages in my thought process in my mind in my rationale in my intellectualizing of things uh, these stages and levels even though it's a process on its own but for me I see it to be spontaneous. If I pick up this piece of paper, I assume one way or another that it was a natural, quick kind of decision that was made then and there. It wasn't premeditated or anything else. But dissecting the process, there are different stages that this very act goes through knowledge is the first where i know about something and then i have an interest in that particular thing and then i have a will to perform that thing and then i have a choice to do that thing and so on and so forth so when i um come into existence it's not in the sense that after coming into existence I have absolutely no say in what it is that I become if my parents are good and religious and Muslim and Shia or Christian or what this or that then that's what I become if I come into if I'm born into a family that's uh, well off then that's who I become if I bo- I'm born into a family that's educated that's what I become if they are all mentally stable, that's what I become. You know, if we were to look at it in this particular way, we wouldn't see so many different scenarios and examples of people who have gone absolutely uh, different, uh, down different avenues through choosing a completely different uh, path than their families. Because even though we believe that something that comes into existence, it needs a creator. But when it is created, it does not mean that it is now completely independent from any kind of divine intervention. And that's what leads me to say that even though we are insisting that we don't believe in that kind of a coerced way of you believing what you're believing in or you thinking or you doing because of you your fate and destiny being as such and there is absolutely nothing that you can do and you have no say in it even though so until now we've been saying that to a certain extent but that's not the whole story because I just made this reference of divine intervention we still are connected to the Almighty, to our Creator. He did create us. He did bring us into existence. He still has 
that control over us, but in the sen- not in the sense that we are like robots and we have absolutely no say in what we do. So we are not completely, completely independent, nor are we completely de- dependent on the Almighty, which is what we call either free will or predestination or determinism. And this is where our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, peace be upon him, had said, لا جبر ولا تفويض بل أمر بين أمرين There is no jabr, there is no predestination, nor is there tafweed, which means free will, that God has uh, completely abandoned uh, us and has no intervention and has no uh, say whatsoever in what it is that we do. بَلْ أَمْرٌ بَيْنَ أَمْرَيْنَ It's something in between. What does it mean by in between? Inshallah, when throughout our discussions, we will continue to explain on this particular uh, topic. Now, when we're looking at us being created, now, if we were to say that we are now completely independent or we were pre-programmed where the high um, creator or the superior being, of course, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, this higher being um, has no control or he created me with everything that was going to happen to me and therefore I have um, no ability to change anything and this means that within me coming into existence I either have no will or I have absolute will now what happens if we were to uh, nullify and kind of dismiss anything to do with our thought process or anything to do with our intellect, or anything to do with what it is that we do as human beings. We can't negate the value of our intellect, our reason, our rationality, this common sense that we have been blessed with by the Almighty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed us with an aql, with an intellect, and therefore uh, whether it be looking at it from the fitri side in us having that uh, human nature, that, that primordial instinct of what it is that we are inclined to do, or anything else along these lines, the worst thing for us to do is what we call ta'atilul aql, or to dismiss the, any kind of value or role that the intellect may have in my choices and my decisions or what it is that I do as far as my behavior and actions are concerned. And this means that if something can exist, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will continue to exist. Or if someone something does exist, it doesn't mean that um, or something is going to exist or can exist it doesn't necessarily mean that it is going to exist by necessity. So if I think about something in particular, it doesn't mean that it is going to come about in reality. It's like me uh, visualizing in my mind uh, as that Almighty God has a partner. Or it's like me visualizing in my mind that I wish to commit so-and-so crime. You know, whatever I think about or whatever that comes within the process of my thoughts doesn't necessarily need to come into reality or existence. And this is another way of us proving that we have control over our thoughts, that we are able to uh, process our ideas in such a way where they are either healthy or unhealthy. Now sometimes, unfortunately, our mind might be clouded 
by misjudgments, by our lust and desire, by our eagerness to pursue our own endeavors, by some kind of a premeditative, premeditated idea, by biased kind of views, and all these other things, which, of course, will not allow me to be able to ascertain or distinguish or to, or to discern what is right and what is wrong, what is good or what is bad, or everything else along those lines. Because if I was to ask you, if you have done something, or if you are going to do something, are you going to do it by choice or and will? Do you have a say in what it is that you are doing? Do you have a say in what it is that you are thinking? Reminding the dear viewers that uh, the initial theme of what it is that we're trying to uh, share with you is this way of looking at belief beyond the scope of how we would probably look into it. Beyond belief, that's the name of the program. So how am I able to kind of like lay out all of these things in such a way where I'm able to pinpoint where did someone go wrong as far as their belief system, as far as their ideology. We're going to continue on uh, speaking about this important topic uh, after a break, so please uh, stay with us. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back to Beyond Belief. Now, I just wanted to remind the viewers that, you know, when we are discussing this problem uh, of how we are able to tackle the foundations of 
uh, an ideology being correct or being true or being false, it stems into the very fact that it goes away from just the mere theological side of it and it's not something only theoretical. You know, there are many issues that are intertwined with uh, how we think and our thought process, whether it be moral uh, decisions, whether it be things that we see uh, around us. You know, how are we able to interpret uh, evil and understand uh, the mind of a criminal? How are we able to look at something and not be judgmental or be judgmental. You know, I, I did mention that sometimes uh, uh, someone might be uh, believing in something and that's probably because uh, some prejudgmental uh, thoughts that they might have or uh, prejudices or being uh, biased towards something or just them not caring about, you know, them living some kind of hedonistic life and, you know, they don't really look at things in that particular way uh, due to the fact that they're so engrossed in the uh, material world. So uh, it's very important for us to you know, anchor ourselves in this kind of way of thinking because on an epistemological level it will solve many, many issues that we have. Because ultimately, why do you do something? You do something because... Besides the fact that it's gone through cognitively, it's gone through so many different levels and that, it's be, do it because ultimately there was some kind of uh, drive that pushed you to doing that particular thing. So you have knowledge about something, you're inclined towards it, you have will in p pursuing it and doing it, and then it turns into a fi'l, an, an action. So... Um, that action is now out there in the open. It is no longer yours anymore, if we could say, because it's now something that became a reality. So um, prior to me looking at it in all those different ways, how am I able to make sure that I am committed to finding the reality of these actions or the reality of these thoughts? So much so that it's going to correspond to the truth and that a piece of information that I have will correspond to the reality of what it needs to be. If I was to go down the avenue of being forced or, co or you know, that I, um, this is my destiny and, and everything else, then what happens to everything that's going on in my soul, in myself? in my nafs, all these things that are processing um, consciously and subconsciously. Because that very action, um, which is the final result, was a build-up of so many different things that's going on. So it's a very small portion of a larger picture. And that's why we say that your choice is greater than your action. Your, the action itself is just a part of what it is that you are able to decide or whether you should do it or whether you should not do it or whether you should think that particular way or whether you don't. Now, it also means that I have that uh, particular ability to either do it or not do it, to uh, accept it or not accept it and you know again uh, in just repeating uh, another very important point you know if we were to be able to uh, refer to a tyrant as someone being responsible for an atrocity for the, some kind of genocide that they may may have committed we can say that they themselves willfully perpetrated that particular crime or that heinous evil act. And this means that they are accountable and responsible, irrespective of their environment or their background or their 
upbringing or anything else. Even though, yes, we do understand that they have contributed to the final product, that all of these things are, of course, elements and factors that produce someone to, to uh, enter into that kind of uh, evil path. But, you know, when we say it in that particular way, we still say that they are accountable um, and responsible. Why is it that Islam, along with other religions, emphasize so much on values? And Islam emphasizes on values being subjective, where you look at them not only for it itself, but what it's going to lead you to, what it's going to grant you, what you will be uh, blessed with, not only in this dunya, not only in this world, in this life of yours, but also you're going to have um, advantages. There are going to be results and outcome for you, waiting for you, once you depart this world. Because as Muslims, we believe that this is only a stepping stone. This life, this short life of ours is going to lead us to something greater, something wider, something more important. If you remember, we spoke about us being in a puzzle. And we're trying to put all of these pieces together. But this puzzle that we look at is very small in contrast to the larger puzzle that is out there. We have choice, we have ikhtiyar, and that means that our actions are done by our choice and whether we are able to pinpoint what it is that led us to this particular thing that is a discussion um, different and on its own. The important thing here is for us to know for a fact that if we are human beings and in our instinct, our nature, we are able to distinguish with what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong. And God has bestowed that upon us by giving us something that we are able to use. And that's why we have the intellect. God gave us the aql, our ability to rationalize, to think logically, to uh, look at things with common sense. And therefore, when we are able to do so, this is going to lead us into making sure that there are things that are going to give us correct explanations for, that there are issues that we need to look, look at beyond that very act itself. Well, even though, as we said, it might be just the word itself, but there are many, many repercussions that are going to happen after it. Whether your, your tongue, and that's why we say that a tongue is like a two-sided sword, seifun dhu haddain, a two-sided sword. You can use it to, for, for dhikrullah, for remembering God, for praising God, for performing your prayer. You can use it for, in, to say something nice to someone, to be grateful to someone verbally, to say thank you to somebody. And we know how valuable that very word thank you is. It's the least way of showing any kind of appreciation. But at the same time, this very tongue of ours can also be so sharp that it hurts someone, that it destroys someone, that it damages someone, that it could probably even kill someone. Ulama al akhlaq have mentioned that there are over 70 sins of the tongue alone, even though it's probably the weakest limb, the weakest part uh, the, uh, of our body, you know, but that's this itself is going to be responsible for so many of our sins. May God forbid us from committing any of them, backbiting and gossiping and accusing and exposing, revealing of a secret, sharing information with others, lying, uh, any of these other things that have been mentioned. So looking at it in that particular way and 
for someone to say, well, I'm not responsible for what it is that I said, or, you know, this is how I was brought up, I have to use vulgar language and bad um, language and things like that. It's, it's, no one's going to accept that kind of, of attitude. Taking it one step further, we can say, well, you're responsible for what you're thinking of, you're accountable for how it is that you think, and therefore when I look at you and when I am saying to you that, well, this particular information is wrong, and that is a false ideology. Now, of course, we're not here uh, saying this in the sense that we're going to be condemning this person or anything else, but we're talking on an ideological level. We don't believe that absolutely everyone is right and absolutely everyone is wrong. There must be some kind of uh, criteria where we are able to say, well, that's where the haqq exists. That's where the truth exists. And that truth is absolute. It's not relative. It's absolute truth. Others might carry a certain level of truth, but it's relative. It's insufficient, incomplete. There are still things that are missing and they have, for example, failed to see the wider picture of things. Now, looking at, at it in this particular way and from an Islamic approach, according to the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, as practicing Muslims, we say to ourselves, we are responsible, we are accountable for what we do, for what we say, for what we think. And Anything that I am thinking of, in that thought process, I need to make sure that I relay that information. Look at all these ahadith from Ahl al-Bayt, where you have some of the companions of the Imams coming to them, coming to the Imams, and sitting with the Imam and saying, I want to share with you, I want to dictate what my belief system is, and please add any kind of shortcomings. And please comment on what it is that I am saying. Compliment those things that I might be falling short of. And then this companion would say that I believe in this, and this is my understanding of Tawheed. This is my understanding of prophecy. This is my understanding of what infallibility and asma means. This is what my, my understanding of what Khilafah means and succession of the Holy Prophet. This is what my understanding of Judgment Day and Ma'ad means. This is my take on this particular uh, issue. You know what this is going to bring if someone was to sit down in the presence of an Imam or in nowadays in the presence of scholars, of qualified scholars. You sit down in the presence of a qualified scholar and you say to them, well, What's your opinion on this particular topic, on this particular area? And my understanding, my understanding, and let's be humble about this as well. Not, let's not say, well, you know what, this is what I believe and, you know, we can agree to disagree and I'm not up for any kind of discussion or, or anything else. We're not talking about, I'm not talking about debating here or anything else, but I'm talking about healthy discussions. We're a positive thinker, someone who is able to, you know, weigh out and scale all the, these kind of things that they might be previously so, so confident about it. They come to realize that uh, in a certain way there was a f particular fallacy that they weren't paying attention to, or it was an incomplete a piece of information or they're absolutely wrong how many times have we come across uh, people who are completely misinformed about something or they just picked it up from for example a wrong source an unreliable source from something from somewhere that was far and is far from the truth Unfortunately, uh, us as Muslims, and in particular uh, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we, our, we have come to see that in today's society, a lot of beliefs have been imposed upon us 
you believe this and you believe that and you say to you know these people around you say well, no that's not what i believe i don't believe in that no i am not using taqiyya this is not what i believe and of course you know this will become a futile argument you won't be able to get to any kind of conclusion so express these kind of ways of adjusting your ideology and belief and as i said complementing it perfecting it completing it we can't do what the companions did in the presence of the holy prophet praise and peace be upon him and the imams alayhim salam by going to them and saying to them this is my understanding of tawhid this is my detailed understanding of this particular what are your what are you able to do to complement it and complete it we can go to scholars and we can refer to ulama and we can say well what's your opinion on this particular topic and with humbleness listen to their way of um, arguing that particular issue and you're able to then look at things in that particular way what does the quran say fabashir ibadi give glad tidings to my worshippers my servants alladhina yastami'una alqawla to those who listen to a view to listen to a an opinion fayattabi'una ahsana but they follow the best of views there are different ideas out there and when you are listening to the particular view you're listening to a a different kind of arguments and evidence put forward but you only follow the best of them even though it might be against you even though you'll probably have to change your ideological way of thinking that you've been building on all of these years even though it might be against what your environment brought you up as or your family members might have brought you up, uh, up as nahnu ashab al-dalil ayna ma mala Namil, we are the peop- followers of evidence. Wherever evidence takes us, we follow, we pursue that, we pursue the haq. And that's why when we say that we, uh, uh, you are going to follow the truth or follow uh, the, the correct, you know, it's all to do with a person and their arguments that they put forward. قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ Again, the Holy Qur'an says, هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Present your arguments if you are among the uh, truthful. So, it is very important for us to delve into this and to understand this. And um, it's not for us to just say, well, that's what God has uh ordained preordained for me and therefore if it's god it's god's decree then whatever he wants to do to us he's going to do to us and it being preordained there's nothing that i can do about it and i can't change who i am or how i am and of course this is going to lead us to the next topic that i'm going to be speaking about inshallah in uh, our next segment of this program beyond belief and that is uh, understanding the differences between people. Why are people different in their belief? Why do we have people who carry different ideologies? And this is what, inshallah, we are going to be discussing in our next session. Please make sure that you keep me in your dua and on behalf of Heidi TV and the producer and everyone here. We would like to thank you all for tuning in and inshallah, hopefully you're all healthy until our next program. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. La ilaha illa Allah, la ilaha illa Allah, la ilaha illa Allah, ma lana. لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله